uh, this is Catherine Redekup. I am presenting my CMM master's thesis on the Holy Spirit. And um, as a Mennonite, we grew up um, not believing that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was for today. And so um, when I was 16 years old and I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, it caused something of a dilemma for me. Um, trying to discern and decipher whether this was really God or it wasn't and so um, since then I've been studying Holy Spirit on and off but I decided that I wanted to really get some good biblical backing and background now on the Holy Spirit and also looking to the future I'm hoping to study more about the Holy Spirit in missions because the truth is that most people that end up on the mission field and seeking the Lord do end up baptized in the Holy Spirit. So I'm looking forward to studying more of that in the future. But for this thesis, I have gone through the Old Testament, through the New Testament. I've gone through what the theologians say and also some of the controversies and verses that were told to me that about the baptism of the Holy Spirit no longer being operating today. And then I've also gone and taken a closer look at uh, the Pentecostal and the Charismatic movements, which um, I'm, we have never personally been a part of, but have learned so much from them. So this is my thesis. One of the loveliest pictures that we have of God in the Bible is at the baptism of Jesus. We have the Son of God going down into the water, being baptized, and at the same time, the heavens open and the Holy Spirit comes down as a dove and remains upon Jesus, and we have the voice of the Father expressing His pleasure in the Son. And so we have a perfect picture of the Trinity. Um, at this point, we see the Holy Spirit uh, as a dove, and the dove is a, is a very neat picture of the Holy Spirit. A dove is sometimes called a lovebird because it has an ability to focus intently on its mate. They're beautiful, gentle, harmless, and easily startled. This is such a good description of Holy Spirit. Jesus accomplished his mission through living in communion with the Father and being filled with the Holy Spirit, and this is the example that we need to follow. In this writing, I uh, intended to follow the Holy Spirit from the dawn of creation through the establishing of the nation of Israel to the upper room where he fell, first fell in tongues of fire and end with his mission to bring the church to maturity. And I set out to prove from the scriptures and from history that the Holy Spirit is active in all his fullness, his gifts, and his ministries in our day, and we must partner with him to fulfill the end time purposes of the Lord. Right from the beginning, of the Old Testament we have the Spirit of God hovering over the surface of the deep and throughout the Old Testament the Spirit is active and articulate and as time went on more and more revealed as a person the word for spirit in Hebrew is ruach and it can mean breath air strength breeze but also the Spirit of God so it can be used as Spirit of God and always there's a there's a difference when it's speaking it's not just speaking of the wind or the breeze as a force but when it says the Spirit of God there's a there's a special designation for that the Spirit of God was hovering over the water that is it uses the word Ruach and later on when he breathed into Adam, the same word ru Ruha is used. After the conquest of Canaan, the Lord put his spirit on various judges throughout time in order to lead Israel. Um, it says, Othaniel, who judged Israel, the spirit of the Lord came upon him, the same of Gideon and Samson, and they did mighty works by the Spirit of God. The Spirit would come on them for a time, for a purpose. Sometimes on prophets, sometimes on artists, sometimes on kings. In the books of the prophets, the prophetic books, we see that the Spirit of the Lord is known as the Spirit of Prophecy. 
it is said of Daniel that the Spirit of God was in him because he had wisdom and understanding. In the prophecy, Ezekiel's prophecy of the Valley of Dry Bones, we have a clear picture of the word of the use of the word ruha in different ways. Twice it's translated as spirit, as in the spirit of the Lord, seven times as breath, and once as wind. Um, the passage starts this way, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones and he caused me to pass by them all around and behold there were very many and indeed they were very dry and he said to me son of man can these bones live and I said O Lord you know and he said to me prophesy to these bones O dry bones hear the word of the Lord thus says the Lord God to these bones surely I will cause breath or ruha to enter into you and you shall live. And I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and so on. Um, and then the Lord goes on to say, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord and have spoken it and performed it. We see the spirit of the Lord with Ezekiel at the beginning, picking him up. And then we see the spirit we see the word ruha used as breath and as wind and so it's it's kind of a play on words in isaiah chapter 11 we begin to see some of the characteristics of the spirit of god we have um, a prophecy about the coming messiah and it says there shall come forth a root from the stem of jesse a branch shall grow out of its shoots the spirit of the lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the lord and of course, the seven spirits of God are also mentioned in the book of Revelation. It ties it all together. So the spirit of Yahweh is also the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Isaiah 63 retells a story from the Exodus where it says that the angel of his presence saved him, saved them, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. And so it connects and it defines the angel of his presence as, in fact, the Holy Spirit. Haggai chapter 2, we have uh, the Israelites rebuilding the walls or the temple. And God promises, for I'm with you according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. So my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. And so the way that it refers to his spirit in this way is the way that it spoke of the pillar, the way it stands, stood with them, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. And so God is saying through Haggai that his spirit will stand with these people rebuilding exactly the way that it stood with the Israelites in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. Um, Old Testament theologians, the theologians um, are not all in agreement. Some say that the Holy Spirit was not known as a person in Hebrew, ancient Hebrew. Um, there are others that have uh, sought to disprove this fact. For example, theologian John R. Levison um, did an excellent work on, on identifying the fact that some of the ways that the Holy Spirit moved in the Old Testament um, although it didn't seem at that time, they didn't maybe understand that it was the Holy Spirit. It was, in fact, and he used exactly these scriptures from Isaiah 63 and Haggai chapter 2. Barnes notes is in agreement with his statement that the Holy Spirit is mentioned in Isaiah 63, 10 and Haggai 2, 5 means God himself, a spirit of holiness. Matthew Henry's commentary takes these verses and applies it directly to the Lord Jesus, commenting, that um, there's a foretelling of the Messiah. According to the Jewish Encyclopedia, everything lives, everything living lives by the Spirit given by God. But there's a difference between the Spirit of Yahweh or the Spirit of Elohim um, and then the general word Spirit. Sometimes in some places they uh, use Shekinah synonymously with Holy Spirit because both were said to rest on people. And we see the way that they wrote about the Holy Spirit is very similar to Holy Spirit throughout the New Testament. Although there was at times kind of a misunderstanding about the Trinity or not a full understanding, yet still they, they recognize the Spirit as a person. 
most of the studies of the Holy Spirit begin in the New Testament. And um, so the Greek for Holy Spirit is pneuma, which comes from a root, which means a breeze or a wind or air, just so just the same as the same as the Hebrew word. The Greek word hagios is the word translated as holy. So when the title Holy Spirit appears, it would be literally translated as the spirit, the holy. So pneuma can be translated as spirit or ghost, but where the word spirit can stand alone, the word ghost is always preceded by holy. During the post-exilic period, we see the Jews returning to Jerusalem, beginning the work of rebuilding, and they're beginning to have a greater understanding of Holy Spirit. And then for years and years, um, there was nothing, about 400 years between the two, what we call the two testaments. And, um, and then suddenly, the Holy Spirit began to move again. And um, Zechariah, the priest Zechariah, had a, a vision of an angel and a word from, from the Lord. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to Mary and to her betrothed, Joseph. And it was the beginning of supernatural activity happening again surrounding the people of Israel. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He wore a coat of camel's hair as Elijah and came in the spirit and the power of Elijah to prepare the way for the Lord. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness and it seems that he learned a lot about the Holy Spirit while he was there. Um, and so he states, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove upon Jesus at his baptism and I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptized with, baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. And so John is testifying that he heard this ahead of time. He heard this ahead and that this is how he identified who the Son of God is. Jesus also had much to teach us about the Holy Spirit. According to, the, according to Jesus, the Father would give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. The Holy Spirit would teach us what to say was not to be blasphemed, he would, that we must be born of the Spirit, that God is Spirit and those who worship Him must worship in Spirit, is the Spirit who gives life, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth, and many other things. He showed us what it was to be a man, a human, fully possessed by the Holy Spirit. During His ministry, Jesus was filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit, perceived in His Spirit what was in the hearts of others, rejoiced in the Spirit, cast out devils by the Spirit, committed his Spirit into the hands of the Father, and breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So, after his resurrection, before his ascension, he spent some days with his disciples and followers, and now that he was in his glorified body, he was able to impart Holy Spirit to them. We read in John 7.39 that they were not able to receive the Holy Spirit in this way before this. So even in those days before Pentecost, even Jesus' closest followers didn't seem to understand that a very significant thing had happened. This was a pivotal moment in history. There was, this was the first group of born-again, spirit-filled people. And uh, so, but he told them, still he told them there's something more coming. He said, wait, don't leave Jerusalem. Um, he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus had risen from the dead during the Feast of Passover. He spent 40 days with his followers before he ascended into heaven. And 10 days later, it was time to celebrate Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. There appeared divided tongues of fire and sat upon them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Pentecost was celebrated at the beginning of the harvest. The first fruits were brought to the Lord. This group of believers, filled with the Holy Spirit, now baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire, were a first fruits of the harvest of the Lord. They were all of one accord and they spoke different languages. So there are you know, ways of tracing what all different languages they spoke. And these were people, people that had converted to Judaism from the surrounding regions. 
These unknown tongues were understood by Jews from every nation under heaven as they heard about the wonderful works of God. But some of them mocked and said, oh, they're drunk. So there was a joy that came with, a joy and a happiness that came with this gift. Peter preached with boldness and clarity, explaining the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Throughout the book of Acts, the apostles and many other followers of the way were repeatedly filled with the Holy Spirit and with joy. In studying the commentaries on the New Testament, I decided to focus on just two passages because there's so many. So Acts chapter 2, this passage uh, about the um, when the first group of believers were filled with the Holy Spirit. There was a difference. Um, so at Pentecost and after, the Holy Spirit would dwell in people and remain permanently, making huge changes from the past. There were three signs that accompanied. There was a mighty rushing wind. There were tongues as a fire and the believers speaking in unknown languages. Um, one of the commentaries commented, the baptism of the Holy Spirit means that I belong to his body. The fullness of the Spirit means that my body belongs to him. So that the baptism is final and the fullness is repeated as we trust God for new power to witness. So they differentiated between that original baptism and the refillings that we see in the book of Acts. The believers spoke in tongues. This word is translated from the Greek dialectos and refers to languages or dialects. And even at that time, it was thought of as a reversal of the Tower of Babel. So whereas at the Tower of Babel, um, there was pride. Now these people were humble. This was they, the Holy Spirit came in humility upon these people that were humble. And then, um, as the as the events at Babel caused confusion and divided people, now the gift of tongues brought people together, and they supernaturally understood each other. The tongues that came upon them were cloven, and perhaps this is to indicate that the followers of the way would have two tongues, one in a natural language which they spoke, and another supernatural, requiring supernatural interpretation. The tongues of fire is translated from the Greek word glossia, referring to the wedge shape in which the fire appeared, to differentiate from dialectos, which were the languages. The other passage that I wanted to focus on is 1 Corinthians 13. Um, this is one of the, of course, sandwiched between 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, where Paul is describing in detail the gifts and the use of the gifts in the church. And he says, of course, to use them in love, that the gifts must be used in love. And so there is a verse that says that these, and so verse 10, which says that, the tongues will cease, prophecy will be done away, knowledge will be done away when the perfect comes. And so the, the discussion in our day is what is that perfect? And so the, com uh, the commentators all agree that the perfect is sometime in eternity or at the end of the age or at the coming of Christ. Um, one of the commentators commented that the perfect could refer to um, could have referred to when the Bible was complete, but we can note that the body of Christ was not mature and complete and perfect when the Bible was complete, which is sometimes the argument today for the, for the cessation of tongues and gifts. Uh, the Corinthian believers appeared to be playing with the gifts like children, and they were arguing about who was the biggest. And Paul didn't, didn't rebuke them for being immature, but he did point it out. He knew that when they were mature, they would be known for their love. So he was teaching them. He's training them. The early church fathers, um, interesting, them when I went to study them, I had searched Holy Spirit in early church fathers, and there was nothing. And I thought, how on earth did they not have a single thing to say about Holy Spirit? And so I went to bed around midnight that night. I woke up at 6 a.m. and realized they said, Holy Ghost. You have to search for Holy Ghost, not Holy Spirit. So I searched Holy Ghost, and sure enough, there were over 3,000 references to the Holy Ghost in the early church fathers. But there's kind of general four general themes um, that they were 
concerned about. For them, um, they had to prove that the Lord Jesus was conceived when the Holy Spirit overshadowed the Virgin Mary, that the Holy Spirit fell on Jews and Gentiles. He was given for the whole world, not Jews only, and that the Holy Spirit is an individual part of the Trinity. So he's fully God, just as the Father and the Son. And to them, it was also very important that the Holy Spirit is the paraclete. So two of the heresies that they had to battle was that um, one was that Jesus was born a normal man, but he became Christ when he received the Spirit at his baptism. So his deity was in question. The second was a story circulating about Mary, that she supposedly had an affair with a soldier, causing Joseph to turn her out of doors. So her virginity was in question. To establish the idea that Jesus was Christ at his birth, the fathers reminded us that he was called Emmanuel, that is God with us. So from the scriptures from Matthew, we see that he was Emmanuel, God with us, from his birth, not later on when he was baptized. Uh, the fathers further argue that he is Christ because he was born of a virgin. And so they, they realized, though, that of course there would be lies. They would, have to make up, they would have had to make up some lies to disprove this if they wanted to question the deity of Christ. So they saw right through this and they said, for they could have falsified the history in a different manner on account of his extremely miraculous character and not have admitted, as it were, against their will that Jesus was born of no ordinary human marriage. So the fact of his virgin birth, birth from a virgin, was... Um, one of the things that they they really needed to establish and it was so important that it made it into the Nicene Creed in AD 381. It was important to them that the Holy Spirit was for Jews and Gentiles. It seems that they were battling the circumcision for their freedom and so they, their response was that we also received the Holy Spirit as those Jews did therefore we do not need to become Jews in order to be pleasing to God. Um, the battle to establish the Holy Spirit as a member of the Trinity seems to have begun with an error expressed by Plato. So Plato had spoken well of the gifts and graces of the Holy Spirit as coming from heaven. Problem was he didn't want to use the word Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost and he called them virtues. So this prodded the fathers to defend the Holy Spirit's place as part of the Trinity. The entire Anthen Anthensian Creed appears to have been written for the sole purpose of establishing the Holy Spirit as Trinity. Part of it says, but the Godhead of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is all one. The glory equal, the majesty co-eternal, such as the Father is, such as the Son, and such as the Holy Ghost. And to the early church fathers, it was so important that the Holy Ghost was the paraclete. He was the comforter, the helper, the advocate that that Jesus had promised. And so this was one of their main themes in speaking of the Holy Ghost. In our day, the controversy um, concerns more about whether the Holy Spirit is still active today in the earth or whether he has ceased, whether the tongues has ceased and prophecy has been done away. And so, as I mentioned earlier, in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, we have this keystone verse that says that when these things will cease, when the perfect comes. And so there are people that believe that this, the perfect was the completion of the canon of scripture or of the writing of the original letters, epistles that would make it into the canon. And of course, it would need to be taken completely out of context in order for it to mean that. Um, Paul said he, he goes into a lot of detail with the Corinthians about the gifts, trying to deal with some of the questions that they had from within their paganism uh, that they had just come out of. And then he says the gifts are nothing without love. And of course this word is agape love, which is the kind of love that God has for us, that we have for each other as believers when we are maturing and growing in maturity. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 if we read it in light of a body of believers growing in maturity, it takes on a whole new meaning. Verse 11 suddenly starts to make sense. It says, when I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. And so love is a mark of maturity. So in this view, let's take another look at the word perfect. The phrase that which is perfect is translated from the Greek teleos, and it shows up in different 
places in scripture and it means fully grown, physical, mature, and it can refer to a person, a human being, or the, um, the maturity of the body of Christ. It also shows up in Ephesians chapter 5 when it says he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body that we can all grow up to a mature man and no longer be children. The whole passage is there speaking of the maturing of the body of Christ and using this word teleos that we will be perfect corporately. This is a corporate um, it's a it's a corporate interpretation. In Philippians 3:12 Paul refers to his own perfection saying not that I have already attained or am already perfected but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Later on he says as many as mature have this mind to the degree that we have already attained let us walk by the same rule let us be of the same mind. And so the word perfect and the word mature in these in this passage are both translated from the word teleos. And so the word perfect here cannot mean the completion of scripture. There is a word, pleru, which would mean it, completing a task or finishing something. If, if scripture had meant that, then they would have used that word. But perfect in this case means, is referring to the maturity of the body of Christ, the maturity of believers. Paul continues to encourage the church to seek the greater gifts because, of, because he who prophesies speaks for edification, exhortation, and consolation. And so the other question that comes up is edification. Is that not just referring to the foundation? If the word edification means that, that we need the gifts for edification and it means building the foundation or laying a foundation, then once the Bible was done, then we didn't need the gifts anymore. And so this is the, the argument but if you take a close look at the word edification, it in fact means the building up of a house, the whole house, not just the foundation. There are words that, that refer to foundation, the foundation which is laid, which is Christ, the foundation um, from before the foundation of the world, that kind of, in that sense, or on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, but that is not referring to to this idea of edification. It's, it's an entirely different word. So from the start of the Reformation throughout the epochs of church since, there has been a gradual restoration of doctrines and the gifts of the Spirit and the offices as well. So Earlier, before the Reformation, there were really only priests. And so through Luther and his people, the, the office of the pastor was restored. The office later through the Anabaptists and others, the office of the teacher was restored. And, um, and then Wesley and the Methodists, they restored the evangelists to the church. And so we've been going through this process of restoration. Well, in the early 1900s, the prophetic gifts were, were restored and the office of the prophet also began to emerge and to come forth. So the revival, the Pentecostal revival that happened started in a Bible school for missionaries in Topeka, Kansas. And so the founder of the Bible College was a Methodist holiness preacher named Charles Parham. And he challenged his students to study the book of Acts, focusing on the Holy Spirit, believing that there was a possible third blessing. So the second blessing um, was what the Methodists had called an experiential sanctification. They said that may be a second blessing after salvation. Parham was saying there may in fact be a third blessing. And so on New Year's Eve 1900, the students held a special watch night praying for the Lord's blessing and guidance for the new year. On the evening of January 1st, 1901, the students were still praying and a young woman named Agnes Osman was baptized in the spirit and began speaking in tongues. She seemed to be speaking Chinese. Someone later who spoke Bohemian said that he could understand her. And so she may have spoken as many as 17 different known languages. And so as she prayed for people and more people prayed with their group, more and more people began speaking in tongues. It was a mission school. 
So they assumed that these gifts were the, for the purpose of missions, so that they would speak the languages of wherever they were being sent. And that did happen at times. In 1906, a young African man, William Seymour, met Charles Parham and wished to attend his Bible school. And so because of segre segregation laws in those days, he was not able to sit in the class, but Parham made a way for him to be there. He, he left the door open to a different room so that Seymour could sit there and learn everything that he needed to that he wanted to learn. And it seems that Seymour absorbed everything, but he did not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit at this time. When he was later offered um, to pastor a church in California, he accepted. And um, But when he spoke about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it closed a lot of doors for him there. But there were some houses, some homes that were open. And so it is that that the, uh, they began to meet in houses and, and, and pray, and people began receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Seymour himself seems to have received the baptism at this time. As the, as the meetings grew and uh, one of the house porches broke off because it couldn't handle all the people there, um, they found another place to meet, and that was the Azusa Street Stable. Um, and so that was the beginning of the Pentecostal revival in Azusa Street. And so because of the early connection to missions and the many missionaries that came to Azusa Street, um, Pentecost spread all over the world. And um, people just received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it was from early on because of the languages that they felt that this was what the gift of tongues was for. Um, the charismatic movement happened um, Later on, it's common today to hear of Pentecostals and Charismatic churches referred to as one movement. It's true that they're often associated and they have a common heritage in Azusa Street, but there are some distinctions. The beginnings of the Charismatic movement are linked to the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International. This was in a, fellow, a fellowship of businessmen um, who were people that believed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they applied biblical wisdom to their various work environments. So during this same time period, David Duplessis, an Assemblies of God pastor from South Africa, became a well-known proponent, proponent of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 1959, a few Episcopalians began to speak in tongues and the rector at one of the Episcopalian churches, Dennis Bennett, also received the Holy Spirit and his story was so remarkable, he ended up in big newspapers and magazines. And so that was the beginning of people seeking the Holy Spirit again. Um, the Catholic churches and university campuses also began experiencing the renewal around 1967. At this time also two books came out. John and Elizabeth Sherrill's They Speak With Other Tongues and David Wilkerson wrote The Cross and the Switchblade. And both of these now, for people that had been curious, now they had a source, places to go to read and to find out what they wanted to know. And so more and more people began to receive gifts of the Holy Spirit, not necessarily speaking in tongues. The Pentecostal churches had hoped that many people would leave their churches and join them, but this didn't happen. Both David Duplessis and Dennis, Dennis Bennett encouraged people to stay in their churches, and the movement grew within the mainline churches and became known as a renewal more than a revival. The Pentecostals had experienced much persecution from other churches and began to consider those churches as dead spiritually, and they were surprised when the Charismatics were able to remain in their churches. This became one of the biggest differences between Pentecostals and Charismatics. The Charismatics did not have the holiness background the Pentecostals had. They were able to affirm most of the doctrinal litur liturgy of their churches, while practicing the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, they, they may have gained acceptance to a large part because they didn't uh, follow all of the holiness rules, the outward holiness rules, and also that they didn't speak of tongues as the only evidence of the Holy Spirit, um, which had become offensive to people concerning the Pentecostal movement. And so... Um, my final section is about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. How to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. First of all, those in Azusa Street early on, um, they emphasized Jesus Christ. They said, don't seek the Holy Spirit. Don't seek the manifestations. Seek Jesus and you will get the Holy Spirit. Earnestly desire. Paul, however, said earnestly desire the gifts. And so if we seek Jesus, we will get the Spirit of Jesus. We will get his Holy Spirit. And... We are even able to seek the higher gifts. 
And then there, it's important to trust that if we ask Jesus, ask the Father for good gifts, he will not deceive us and give us something evil. Um, Luke eleven thirteen says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And then finally, rest in the Lord. Let him give you the gifts that he knows you need. Then be quick to obey when he wants to use you. There is also an element of impartation. You may have to have someone pray for you. But anyone that has the baptism of the Holy Spirit is generally able to impart that gift. If you are also seeking that gift, the, the baptism and the different gifts that go with that. So in this writing, we've studied a lot of the scriptures um, concerning Holy Spirit from New Testament and Old Testament, and a lot of what the theologians have said, and uh, also discussed some of the, the hindrances that we have in our day, the, the false teachings that we need to overcome. And um, so also talking about the Pente uh, Pentecostal and charismatic renewals movements, um, there was a renewed emphasis on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We learned from the charismatics not to put God in a box, that he can do things differently with different people. He can, he's sovereign and he can choose. Knowing that the Holy Spirit is still at work and available today, there is evidence from scripture that in history supports this view. Many are again asking how to receive the Holy Spirit. The answer is always, as it has always been, ask the Lord in humility seek to hear and obey in the days ahead we will see the glorious consummation of the body of christ fully mature the bride of christ ready for her heavenly bridegroom and the perfect ending of this age so let us press on to know the lord and partner with his spirit until that day